How's your back feeling? Hopefully it's feeling good, but if you're anything like 80% of the population, you might be experiencing some amount of acute or chronic back pain in your life. I'm Dr. Benjamin Alter, and this is the Alter Your Health Podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. Today, we're talking all about back pain, but not just back pain because Let's face it, back pain has a lot to do with other chronic conditions that we might be experiencing when it comes to our health. And back pain is one of the most common places for tension to show up in the physical body. And the implications of this are huge. A lot, a lot, tons of money, billions of dollars, $50 billion in fact are spent on treating back pain and let's face it, very much of the time, unsuccessfully through chiropractic adjustments, pharmaceutical medications, and oftentimes surgery. A lot of these back pain conditions are managed symptomatically, but things kind of resurface and conditions resurface in return and people struggle throughout their lives. I mean, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge mess. And A lot of people are told that they have a slipped disc or a herniated disc or some sort of anatomical anomaly that is contributing to their back pain. But in this episode, we're talking about a totally alternative perspective when it comes to to back pain. And this is the perspective brought forth by Dr. John Sarno through through all of his books, including his really phenomenal book called Healing Back Pain, which has supported literally millions of people in healing their back pain and unfortunately we are not going to have dr sarno on as a guest in this podcast today he did pass away a couple years ago at the ripe old age of 93 however this week's guest is michael galinsky he produced a phenomenal film about dr sarno's work because Michael Galinsky has a very intimate relationship with Dr. Sarno as he saw him as a patient along with several family members. Um, So Michael has been healing his back pain and he created an excellent documentary that documented the healing journey. And I saw this documentary just a few months ago and it was very inspiring and impactful for me. So I feel very grateful and fortunate to have had the opportunity to connect with Michael who created this awesome film that has been helping you know raise awareness of Dr. Sarno's work which is for sure living on. Uh, This work is mind-body medicine. This work is um, you know using the mind to support the body in healing and like I said this conversation is a lot about back pain and healing the back but the implications of these sort of this sort of information and knowledge and wisdom is can be broadly applied to healing from any acute or chronic condition. So because we didn't get into what Dr. Sarno's approach is that much, even though the approach um, is, you know, we go in, they go into depth in that, of course, in the documentary film which is, by the way, called All the Rage, and you can find out more at alltheragedoc.com, A-L-L-T-H-E-R-A-G-E-D-O-C.com. But anyways, Dr. Sarno is pretty much supporting people in healing by prescribing knowledge, by prescribing awareness around really the root of the issue. And Dr. Sarno says that 99% of the time, the root of the issue when it comes to back pain is what he calls TMS or tension myositis syndrome and essentially there's muscle tension that cuts off blood supply and nerve supply and starves tissues of oxygen that creates more muscle spasms and it's kind of this cycle that can become a chronic issue so that is really the source of so much acute and chronic back pain and really pain in so many other areas, not just the back. So if you have pain or if you know someone who does, you're definitely gonna wanna listen to this whole episode and you're definitely maybe gonna wanna also check out Michael's documentary film that was released a couple years ago. I was a a little late to the party, but I I finally found it. And once again, it's called All the Rage. 
So hope you enjoy this one with Michael Galinsky. And before we dive in, just a reminder, subscribe, rate, review, leave some comments, leave a little piece of feedback. This information helps me grow and learn and continue evolving and expanding in a positive direction when it comes to this podcast and sharing important information with the world. So enjoy and let me know what you think and see you on the other side. All right, Michael, welcome to the Alter Your Health podcast. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Yeah, glad that we've made the time to connect and, um, you know, go into more depth on this beautiful film that you've made. I know you're you're a filmmaker right. and uh, you're not a typical guest on the podcast. I guess filmmakers aren't typical guests, but you've well, I'm got not a typical this... filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- that's probably why you're here. Um, so, yeah, you've made this film that has touched a lot of people about Dr. John Sarno. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of outline, outlining his work over his life. And it was just really impactful to me personally. And I know Dr. Sarno impacted you personally, deeply in your life. And that's what you document, documented in the film. And would you like to just start by, you know, sharing a little bit about your history, um, specifically maybe with back pain and how you came to find Dr. Sarno? Well, the story starts way before I had any back pain or any problems at all. Well, it starts really with my father, who was a psychologist, who, um, he, when I was in second grade, he almost died of an ulcer. Um, and so he was in the hospital. And I, I, as I say in the film, I remember having to point the ambulance to the right house, which, you know, saying it out loud is like, oh, that probably was pretty traumatic in itself <laughs> and kind of, you know, how difficult that must have been for me at the time, which isn't really something we often think about, um, but is connected to this story. A- anyway, my father had this ulcer. He got better. And like a couple weeks later, we had a, a fender bender. It was nothing. I mean, like we, you know, made this little move in the car, but he got incredible whiplash from it that lasted for years. And finally, someone handed him Dr. Sarno's book. And, and I remember he would come home from work, he'd get a whiskey, and he'd sit in this traction device, like that was lifting his neck up, or he'd always be on the floor after work. And he wasn't actually someone who manifested a lot of direct stress, like he didn't seem like a stressed out person, um, but he certainly carried a lot of it. And um, he read the book, and he got better, almost, almost immediately, and he became an evangelist. My father was a very cheap man, but he bought a box of the books, and he gave them to everybody who ever complained of back pain. And a lot of those people got helped. And that's how Dr. Sarno's work really got out there. There's two aspects. One is just that word of mouth and Howard Stern. Howard Stern talks about him a lot. So that's how a lot of people know about him, which creates this kind of really weird intersection of people who are fans of Dr. Sarno. Um, anyway, a few years later, my brother was in graduate school and had lost the ability to drive or to type because he could not use his hands because he had carpal tunnel syndrome. And as he says in the movie, he wanted to see all of the experts. He saw the expert on carpal tunnel syndrome. Nothing helped. And finally, they told him he had to have bone carved away in his collarbone to free some of the nerves that were going to his neck, which was insane. It didn't make any sense. My dad said, listen, if, if you don't go see Dr. Sarno, I, I'm just not going to talk to you anymore. So my brother went to see Dr. Sarno in New York. And he had resisted it for a long time because my dad had sent them the book. And he, you know, he kind of read the book but didn't take it that seriously. Um, Went to see Dr. Sarno three weeks later, he was better. And at that point, I was probably about 21, 22 years old. I read his book. And my back would go out once or twice a year, you know, two or three days at a time. It was never that big a deal. But like, oh, my back's out, stuck on the floor for a couple of days. And then I was fine. And it, I didn't feel like I was someone who had a bad back. But I read the book and I saw myself on every page like so many other people. And I banished that for 10 years. Then I had a kid, a house, two films, all, all this pressure was on me and I just got crushed by it. I was actually reading the book again, but it didn't, didn't work. Um, and that's when I went to see Dr. Cerner myself. Mm-hmm. And that's when I slowly started to get better and he agreed to let us make a documentary, which we found impossible to make because he wasn't really a character who would kind of put himself out there in a way that you could follow like in, as a character. Um, and there was so much profound resistance to this idea that it was really difficult to even discuss, let alone get anyone to help support the movie. Hmm. So. Yeah, well, well, you did it. 
<laughs> it, well, actually, we, we paused for like five or six years until it happened again. And at that point, literally, um, excuse my language, but when my back went out as severely as it did, it had been getting bad and worse and worse. I screamed, grab the fucking camera. We're making this movie. Because in that moment, I realized that the only way we were going to make it is if we had a character and I would have to be it, which is not something I wanted to do. But I realized it was the only way to tell the story. Yeah, I could imagine that that in and of itself just... Um, you know, what am I trying to say? Just really recognizing and acknowledging the pain was probably a healing experience when it was just like, I'm going to own this. I'm going to, I'm, it seemed like you were really demonstrating your willingness, your openness to just heal in that well, moment. It was actually my, my desperateness, really. And, Des yeah. and, and that's something that we, you know, I filmed a lot in those 20 days that I was on the floor and only a few moments go in because it was kind of mm -hmm. so, uh, it was so N of one. It was so, so personal as to be specific enough that it makes it easy for someone to go, okay, well, that's not me. And so this is just going back to kind of storytelling and trying to get these ideas across. One of the reasons we had trouble making the film earlier is we, we had trouble finding characters who would go see him for various reasons. But it's also really figure out, hard to figure out how to film somebody in that very fraught emotional space when the camera changes no matter what, the camera's gonna change their experience, who they are, how they act, and what they communicate. So for me, the difficulty was like, okay, I've gotta be that person, be aware of it, be as naked as possible, but not so naked that it turns people off. So it's all this kind of weird balancing act of how to tell the story. And in fact, once we started to make the movie, it wasn't very personal. I mean, that was a way into the story, but it was really trying to focus on the evidence and, and trying to prove the point because there's so many people who are so skeptical, but if you just give them the evidence, hopefully they'll see that, well, this evidence is so profound that they have to believe it. The truth is though, it's just like our political situation is instead of embracing that evidence, they're thinking of something to counteract it constantly. Well, that can't be true. And this can't be, true. we couldn't have this whole medical system that does everything the opposite if this was true, because actually to accept that, <laughs> you know, everything just falls apart. And it's mm -hmm. like that, that's so crushing to people. So they, they can't. So what we had to do, so in the first, we did like 70, 60, 70 rough cut screenings in our house in order to figure out what was working and how the, the information was being communicated. And the skeptics at first were like, I need, well, that information is really good, but I need more. I need you to really prove it to me. So we kind of more information, more information. We created this lock tight case for why he was right. And they still wanted more. They still wouldn't buy it. So then we realized you just have to take all that out and give them the most bare bones experience, but then force them to actually be present emotionally with what those ideas mean. And so finding that balance between inserting more of myself in it and other people's stories in it, and yet still getting the information in there was a really long, arduous process. And um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean... <laughs> You know, as is uh, stated in the film, and as we know, you know, back pain is ubiquitous in our society. You know, right. everyone's got a little bit of back pain at some point in their life. And whether or not they're on the floor for a couple weeks at a time, um, you know, I think people can relate with just the intensity of desperation, being in pain, and not really having an answer besides the conventional painkillers that are you know, a growing, growing, huge, huge problem in our, in our world. Yeah. And so. it's not just painkillers though. It's the surgeries. And oh, the whole, yeah. so the movie, as much as it's about storytelling, it's also about framing and trying to get people to slightly shift their understanding of how much they frame the world through a very specific lens, because that makes it easier to move through the world. Like, you know, the interesting thing about randomized control trials is science loves them because it, simplifies and clarifies information, supposedly. But it mm -hmm. does so by controlling for certain things. Thing. Well, it, it would be too complex if we put in you know, a multimodal factor in there. So all we're gonna look at is X. But that, and then, and then it's like That's everything else real. is woo. It's not real, yeah. it's not how we experience yeah. the world. So emotions, because they're so complex and so based on our whole, world of experience our, our even our dna experience everything it's so complex right that what they do is they say well we're just gonna control for that in other words pretend that the emotions don't exist because if we actually include emotions in our data well then our data is not clear and we don't know what it really means because all health is really n of one you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um 
but to accept, that, that doesn't mean that drugs aren't useful. I mean, obviously, like I almost died of um, a MRSA infection. I, I was on an on a IV drip of vancomycin for 10 days. And on the third day, I was like, you know, we're supposed to go to Santa Fe on Friday. Do you think I'll be able to go? Uh, Mr. Galinsky, I, I think we're, you don't really understand it, but we're dealing with a potential mortality situation here. You know, mm. and I did need those drugs. But what was interesting about it when I look back um, was that I got that MRSA infection shortly after we had a miscarriage, right? So we're all kind of, we all come into contact with MRSA a lot mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the subway poles. It's when your immune system is really compromised is when it can get in there and do what it does. And totally. so why was my immune system compromised? Because I was, I was experiencing grief and I actually made conscious effort to experience that grief but I didn't really do it that well. And, I, and I'm like, looking back, I'm 100% sure. I mean, I thought, oh, I maybe got the MRSA when we went to the hospital to have the DNC at, um, at three and a half months, right? Because, you know, MRSA is in hospitals. But that wasn't mm -hmm. it. It was, yeah. that was like great. You, yeah. Like you said, it's, it's everywhere. All of it's these everywhere. things are everywhere. And, yeah. um, and, and, and it's not just back pain. Yeah, I guess you could think of back pain as being everywhere. And when we are susceptible to it, we feel it. It's kind of like, maybe you could think of it in the same way. Right, because okay. back pain is acceptable. Like we all, because everybody has it, it's not, um, it's not something you, like, so if you it's say, I, I can't norm. come into work today, right. I can't come yeah. into work today because I'm in grief about, you know, my mother's situation. But you can say, I can't come in because my back went out and I can't move. So it becomes okay. socially acceptable, but also fiscally acceptable <laughs> and systems access to, uh, you know, acceptable. But the truth is, when you actually start to talk about that complexity, um, the reason that Dr. Sarno came to understand the connection between back pain and um, repression of emotions and um, took that mind-body approach that he did was because when he couldn't heal people with everything he'd been taught as standard care, um, he went and he looked at the data and he didn't find any data to support bed rest or hot and cold or electrical stimulation. No, none of the stuff that was being done, there wasn't any data. It was just what they did. But he also looked at his patients' charts, and he saw that 88% of them had a history of two or more other psychosomatic issues, eczema, colitis, migraines. So it's not just back pain, but that helped him to see that this is a way to treat the back pain. But the truth is that same treatment can be applied to almost all illness. To some, I would say 100% of illness will benefit from trying to figure out what's going on in our lives and, and owning it to some degree. And that is not easy to do. Right. It's not easy <laughs> to do as a doctor, as a practitioner, or as a patient at healing. Right. Um, I mean, it's hard to take that approach and, you know, not, you don't know me that well. This is our first meeting, yeah. but that's kind of one of the many approaches that I take with people is figuring out what really is going on because there's always, well, there's always some, there's not always, but there's usually some degree of physical issue that's, yeah. you know, yeah, That's why it's called integrative medicine. It's right. inter integrating the physical and the emotional. It's not, right. it's all in your head or, you know, think it away. It's that these two factors are, are complex. They're so yeah. complex. And it, it, it's not just the muscles. It's not just the heart. It's the whole system, which is affected by these things, you know, and if yeah. we know that, then we can address it. If we pretend it's not true, you can't address it. Totally. You know? Totally. So for those of you, those of us who don't know Dr. Sarno as intimately as you do, um, what is his approach in a, in a nutshell? You referenced the book that he wrote, but what is he saying in his book for those of, those of us that haven't read it? And what, um, what would he say if you were to see him as a patient? So the last line of the movie is, it all comes down to one very simple idea. The mind and the body are interconnected. That's it. That's the whole story. And I think that's the simplest, most important thing that anyone can take away from what he had to say. Mm -hmm. And he discovered that partly because when he was also looking at this stuff, he was looking at this stuff in the 60s. So he was going back looking at other research. And he found that there was tons of research being done in the 30s about stress and how it affected the endocrine system, the lymphatic system, just every different system in the body. So he recognized that it has everything to do with fear. But what is that fear about? You know, so he started to look at, look at it from a Freudian perspective and think, okay, it's this fear that these repressed emotions will arise. 
That's, that for him was the main driver of it. And so he started to take that approach um, and talk to his patients about what was going on in their lives and what might be bothering them that they weren't fully recognizing. And those who bought that idea and thought about it and recognized the things got better. So he, he recognized right away that if the people weren't doing that work or open to the idea, it wasn't going to help them. So the, the whole idea is to really learn to just think, okay, what is going on that I'm not dealing with? And it's not easy because, you know, it's often really deep. It's learned behaviors. So you actually have to look at the way you frame yourself in the world. And so he talks about goodists, right? People who will do so much for others because they learn at a really young age that they have to take care of others in order to survive. So maybe, um, you know, your parents have too much going on in their own lives to really give you that love and attention you need. So you learn to just not ask for it because that can actually bring trouble. And so you instead, you try to provide for them emotionally. So this is the kind of patient he's talking about, or our goodest who are always trying to do for others. As an example, he writes in his book, like one of the early patients was, so what's going on in your life? And the guy said, oh, it's, I have a really good life. You know, I love my wife and um, her mother lives with us. And that's really great because she picks up the kids after school and she watches them. And he said, it must be really hard to have your mother-in-law living with you. He goes, well, you know, she was supposed to be there for a month and it has been five years. So it gets a little, I must be really enraging. He's like, yeah, it's really enraging. You know, and once he accepted that, his back pain kind of lifted and he recognized that it's just, you're holding all this in and holding things in it takes enormous amounts of energy, especially when it's being done unconsciously. Um, and, you know, we see this as people get weaker. Like, so currently my mom, uh, I, we were supposed to do this a couple weeks ago, but my mom was in the ER and then the intensive care for a pneumonia. Wow. So when she went yeah. to the ER, actually she had went to the ER a week or two weeks earlier for shoulder pain. And I tried to do everything I could to get her out of there as soon as possible because I kind of knew what was going on. Um, she might've actually already had the pneumonia then, which is something I think about. And they only did the x-ray for the shoulder and they didn't see the lungs. A anyway, the point is in that space where she was really stressed, she was saying things to me like, um, you have to call... Uh, the car place tomorrow because the taillights need to get fixed and the lymphedema specialist says that I got to cancel the dentist appointment because it was they were all these fears were conflating into one mass you have to handle this trying to hold it all in so trying to hold in all those fears and those anxieties when you lose your strength they all come up and it's almost like this demon coming out of you but if you recognize that we're doing that all day every day it's exhausting Mm -hmm. So the more we can kind of recognize it, it doesn't mean you have to uh, be a, an ass, but you kind of can recognize what you're holding in, you know, it's weird. Totally. Yeah, it's, <laughs> just, uh, it's just this elevated perspective of the emotional body and uh, the, in, like you said, uh, the interconnectedness of the two, the mind and the body. Um, so, you know, Dr. Sarno wrote this book and that has helped probably you know 10 10 millions of people just the book you know without any other information i i really love one line in the in the movie that dr sarno says the prescription is knowledge or awareness you know of, yeah. of this connection That's and it. his prescription is knowledge and yeah yeah and, and, and one of the interesting things yeah go ahead yeah uh, well my question was you know like you know the, the book does help so many but it also doesn't help a lot you know well, like it there's goes, some people yeah. who need more. So, could well, you, so it goes back yeah. to exactly what he was saying. Those who can buy the prescription, who are willing to kind of do that little bit of work, get better much more rapidly. And those who are like, this is BS, don't get it. And there's so many stories about people who get the book and say, this is nonsense, throw it across the room, never look at it. Five years later, they read it again, and they're like, oh my God, that's me. Because mm -hmm. you know, so much of this is about story. It really is. And his books, so he has Healing Back Pain, which is a really good book, and a couple other ones that are like it, ab about kind of the ideas that are telling stories. And then he's got one more for doctors called The Divided Mind, which has all the information. So people always ask me, which book should I read? Well, if you need it to be proven to you, then you read, need to read The Divided Mind, because it's got reams of data and other professionals explaining why this is true. But if you're someone who uh, is more emotionally based, you know, it's less skeptical in general and more open to ideas. I would say he healing back pain because the stories help people connect to their own story. And so what we tried to do is find a space in between those two books as we made the movie where we tried to get some of the information in there, but not in an evangelical way, just in a factual way and, and making these connections. And, you know, for me, I'm, as a filmmaker, 
I'm also, you know, a musician and an artist and, you know, I, I never really had a, a real job and I've always resisted all kinds of systems, every kind of system. Mm -hmm. And I think systems are so problematic because systems, once they start to get in place, start to become self-sustaining. So for instance, if you think about like how knowledge moves through the world, right? Dr. Sarno recognized that the knowledge base that had built up had really big flaws and he tried to present it to his colleagues. And that was a challenge to the system. So he was totally isolated, right? And we made this film in a way that normally people don't make movies. It's kind of personal, it's kind of scientific, it's kind of, you know, all these different things. So no one knows what to make, make of it in the film world, so it doesn't really fit there. The point being that you keep making me think of something that's so interesting, even in this world of all these people doing it, there's so much siloing that goes on. Like there's a guy who wrote a book that's really powerful called How Healing Works at um, George Washington uh, Center for Integrative Medicine. His name's Wayne Jonas. And I was so excited when I read it because what he, he came to the conclusion, this is a guy who's a scientist, 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 who does studies of studies of studies. And after 40 years of this work, he came to the conclusion that 80% of healing comes from within. Fully 80%, only 20% comes from the healing agent, be it the surgery, the drug, the doctor's intervention, the talking, any of those things are only 20%. And we need that 20%, you know? Right. That 20% is a huge amount, but 80% comes from within. But if we're thinking of the doctor as being 100% and we're not accessing that ability that we have to heal, it's gonna be a problem. Now, I tried to get in contact with him and it, you know, his assistant totally blew me off because I think these things are so connected. And I tried to connect him to the PPDA, which is the Pathophysiological Disorder Association, which is siloed from this association. And like, you know, I got in touch with Gabor Maté and got him in the film. He's an incredible doctor who came to a very similar understanding as Dr. Sarno, but about autoimmune disease and wrote a book called um, When the Body Says No. So in other words, if you're a goodist who can't say no to people who ask something of you, then your body is going to say no for you in the form of autoimmune disease. It's going gonna, it's gonna to say no. I can't do this anymore, which is so much of the time what the back pain is. It's like, no, I can't do this anymore. I can't do one more thing for one more fool who's driving me crazy, but I just said yes to it. And then your back goes out. So there's all these weird connections, but they're all siloed. Like if all these different people could go, oh, this is the same as this is the same as, then all of a sudden the whole thing connects and we all understand it. But because we all get in these systems, it's so dangerous for us to go across that aisle and talk even to this doctor over here because, well, he's a gastroenterologist and I'm a, you know, a physiatrist. So we should, well, it's different things. And, and they get so siloed. It's crazy. Sorry. That's, that's my rant. <laughs> oh man, I'm, I'm with you. I, I yeah. mean, when I was in naturopathic medical school, everyone would ask, so what are you going to specialize in? And I was just like, specialize, <laughs> <laughs> like, how about people? How yeah. about, yeah. Like, you know, I, I would end up saying like, I'm specializing in non-specialization, you know, just like holistic, like truly right. holistic medicine people. Um, yeah, yeah, so true. So what would you say, you know, back to this question of, you know, the yeah. book helping so many people and just how it's important to be open and, and crack into oneself and that healing potential. But a lot of people are resistant, you know, and it seems like in the film, Oh, you were resistant. resistant still, <laughs> you know? so, 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 it's hard. so what helps those resisted people kind of crack open and just open up to the potential of the mind and the body being connected and really kind of diving into that? Gosh, I really, I wish I knew a better answer. And, but the one thing I, cause the one thing I have learned about all of this is, um, Someone said, someone tweeted something to me about, you know, keep on evangelizing. And I'm like, whoa, no, <laughs> no evangelizing whatsoever. Because as soon as you try to prove something to someone who doesn't already believe it, you're actually creating resistance. It's like when you push on water, it, it, it absorbs it and pushes back, right? And it's the same thing. So anytime you're trying to get someone to believe something they don't already believe, they're not, you're not, you're not helping them and you're not helping you. So I've really learned to offer as a gift, here's this idea, and just let it go and have no energy attached to it. Because I've also, through this whole process, learned a lot about the import of energy. And, you know, so as someone who does have this issue, I think one of the things that's, a, if you are really overly concerned with taking care of other people, you also get really in touch with nonverbal cues and non-linguistic tells. So you learn how to respond to avoid problems 
from those situations. And so literally now, like I'll be talking to people and I, I, I get the energy that they're giving. They, they, may, they may think they're not communicating anything because they didn't use any words, but we, we all know what you're saying, even if you don't say anything. And so sometimes, I, so I know you don't think this is true, but you've made it really clear to me X. And they're like, it's not true. And I'm like, okay. Um, but that's what I'm, I'm feeling. And that's my, how I'm responding to it. So I'm trying not to react to that thing you're, that's coming through. And I'm trying to respond by telling you. And oftentimes that can be very difficult because the reason they're not using words is because they don't want to admit they're doing that. And so I'm kind of off the subject, but my point is, um, how do you get someone to buy this idea? You can't. So when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So all you can do is just always be there ready to teach when they're ready to learn, but you can't tell them. And, and Dr. Sarno learned this very early on. And he, he quickly learned that he would, he actually pre-interviewed people before they would come in. He'd say, are you open to the idea that your back pain might have something to do with your emotions and the repression thereof? And if they said, absolutely not, that's ridiculous. He'd say, I really think you should see somebody else because I can't help you. And it's like going to the auto mechanic and saying, what's wrong with my car? And they say, well, you need a new uh, alternator belt and you need um, to change your oil. And you say, well, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so why did you come to me? You know what I mean? Yeah. So he says, you know, you need to look inward. And they say, I'm not going to do that. He's not going to take your money, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, I guess, That's so fair. the point is, I do think the one thing we can do is just be super present with people. Because the more present you are without trying to communicate, you know, then, like if someone's really angry with you and they yell at you and you respond by yelling back, then they, then it escalates. And you, if you respond to negative energy with negative energy, you get a thermonuclear reaction. If someone's yelling at you and you're just present and not reactive at all, it just goes through you until finally it just pours out and then they're done. And then you can actually have a conversation. It's really hard, but the more you do it, the more you realize, oh, their anger isn't about me. It's about them. And so for me to respond to that anger isn't about them. It's about me. So I just don't have to respond. You know, I don't have to react to it. I can respond by just being there. And then it's, it's really, it's wild when you start to do that. Um, you see that things just die down. Like, mm -hmm. and, and you'll see it also oftentimes when you'll see someone who's having a really difficult time, like a video where someone's freaking out. And there's one calm person who just like puts a hand on them. And then this, 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 this whole thing de-escalates. Mm -hmm. And yeah. even that can help people to kind of recognize that pattern. I don't know. There's I'm a rambling. lot. There's a, <laughs> well, in the ramble, there's a lot of really important wisdom yeah. nuggets that um, I think are really important for a lot of people when it comes yeah. to this sort of topic. Um, but I imagine there's also, you know, these kind of people who are very open to, you know, this uh, pre-screening question that doc Dr. Sarno would ask, would you be open to consider that, um, you know, your back pain might be a result of your emotions or the yeah. suppression thereof? And people would be like, oh, yeah, I'm totally open. But there, right. But then there was some kind of disconnect, like, of actually being able to access right. that. And I know Dr. Sarno would sometimes prescribe psychotherapy sessions. Right. Yes. Um, more and more over time. Yeah. I think there was a lot more um, stigma attached to it early on. So people, he was just like a last resort. He said only 5% of the people need it because he was yeah. having a lot of great results. But I would say probably 80% could, you know, honestly, 100% could benefit from it. Yeah. Everybody can benefit from someone listening to them. For me, one of the issues is <clears throat> my dad was a psychotherapist and um, he was not fully uh, ever dealing with his own stuff. And so even in that unconscious way, I had a lot of um, resistance to that because I was like, this stuff is BS. Like my dad does this, but isn't this, right? So like it was just this kind of weird um, dissonance that kept me resistant to it as well. Um, mm -hmm. And just learned behaviors and learned attitudes, all those things. Um, and I still actually haven't done a great deal of that, but I have done a great deal of, you know, meditation and journaling. And so one of the things that Dr. Sarno suggests right away is journaling, you know, and, and there's so much data about journaling and actually journaling with it, your hand writing is so much is actually different than typing on a computer. Totally. So when we hand write in a journal, you don't have to read it back. Just things start to come out that you don't realize, you know, and kind of being an artist, I, I've started to learn about, Oh, there's so much stuff that comes up unconsciously that isn't conscious at all until many, many years later. You're like, oh, now I see the connection between what this is and this is and this is and this is. And it's kind of like kind of making connections between both events in your life, decisions you make in your life, and really stepping outside yourself to think about how you frame the world uh, and what that means. So for instance, you know, someone who's really judgmental, 
is also really self-judgmental. So if you're really judgmental about things and you can start to recognize, oh, wow, I'm probably judging myself to an even higher degree. And I'm, I'm just not being present with what I feel because there's so much shame attached to it. You know, mm -hmm. so just the more you can do to really just be real about who you are and not be like, well, who I am is who I am and I'm not changing. Actually, so if you're not changing, then you're dying. You know, it's like you're not growing, right? And so if we can recognize the idea that who we were is not who we are and who we were was never who we are. It's just a whole set of learned behaviors and attitudes. And who we are is really something much deeper um, and, and something we learned early on in life that wasn't okay. And so we start to learn who that is, then we start to be more comfortable in our own lives. And what's really interesting is the more you become more comfortable in your own life, the more comfortable people are around you because you're not mm -hmm. having that closed energy. And um, yeah. then they'll start telling you everything. Yeah, no, I can, I can feel, I mean, I'm comfortable with you. I can yeah. feel that you have cleaned out a lot and made a lot of room to connect. There's still a lot of shit there, but yeah, I <laughs> have. <laughs> <laughs> so on on that note, you know, in in the movie, it was it was so awesome how, um, like we were talking about earlier, at this balance of really personal but really kind of relatable. And um, was there a turning point in your personal story with your back pain where it was just like, you know, ev the you know the weight lifted and the light w appeared in your life because there was you know it it did seem like it was a things were stuck for a little bit. Yeah, that, that 20 days on the floor was an epic internal battle where yeah. um, I, it was just this constant realization of stuff. Like at one point I was texting somebody and I just, I was getting so stressed, I couldn't do it. And I stopped and I was like, oh, I'm texting that person right now to make them feel better, like to make, to assure them that I'm okay so they don't worry about me. And so once I realized that that was my intention, and then I was able to think, no, I really just actually want to update them so that they know, so that I can tell them this. I was fine. And these things were like, I was in such a horrible state that um, the smallest thing had a huge physical response in my body, which was actually a great gift because it made it really clear how those emotions were. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was at the peak of like, the, it was just at a breaking point. And so everything was really clear. So I was having these intense pains and reactions but learning so much from them. And just because I learned it didn't mean it went away immediately, but I was kind of walking down the mountain by many little steps, um, but still making the same mistakes. So in the movie, um, the reason I hit the floor the second time when I screamed, grab the camera, we're making this movie, uh, I had pushed myself way beyond my capacity, which is something that goodest will do, like never good enough. I got to keep pushing, pushing. I got I to gotta get through this thing. And we had a movie that was really good. We knew it was good and we were just getting rejected every which way. So there was this incredible frustration about not getting out. And, then, and I did a Q&A at every screening on the opening weekend when my hip was already completely making it almost impossible for me to walk. And every day it got worse. I, I could barely make it in the theater. And it was like three days later when we had done incredible, we did like $20,000 opening weekend. It was like the biggest independent film that weekend. And that note one other theater would show it because I said, oh, it's just a, a local story or it's just a specific, you know, they just ignored the success and then no one would show it. And the frustration was so great and just overwhelming. That's when I hit the floor. Um, but right when that happened, we got invited to this really important film festival, which was 21 days away. And I was like, I'm going to make it there. So I kept trying to get better. And after like three, two and a half weeks, I was able to crawl up the stairs to get in my bed. Cause I was literally on the floor of my office. I could not move. I mean, I could, I'm talking shitting in a bucket, barely able to do that. I mean, it was bad, right? Got upstairs. And then the day before uh, I had a doctor friend come over and he gave me uh, a muscle relaxant. And I was like, I'm going to do this. And I had this really positive attitude. And I was like, I know I could do it. I did this hypnotherapy session. Could... So the next morning came and I literally, you know, I hadn't walked yet. But I, I dragged myself down two flights of stairs into a cab in incredible pain, totally out of it, get to the gate. I had to get pushed on a luggage cart to get to the gate. I got to the gate and they were like, and I had, this was my wife and two kids because we were going to this big festival. It was going to be great. They were like, dude, you are not getting on this plane if you cannot sit up. I'm sorry. You're going home. Getting home was 10 times worse than getting there. I mean, it was so bad. But I had once again tried to push beyond my capacity. I hadn't listened to my body, which says, you know, you're not ready for this. 
And so even that itself, I learned so much about how easy it is to, to slip back into those same patterns of just pushing too hard. And so in that, and that's in the movie. I mean, I didn't actually film all the way to the airport, so we didn't have to deal with all that. But I did film when I got back home and just said, you know, here I am doing the same thing. And so we're going to, some of us are going to read that book and get better immediately because they're going to see it. And some of us are going to go, I recognize that, and then slowly get better, but continue to make the same mistakes. And, and I don't make um, many of those same mistakes anymore, even since that movie. I mean, because actually, here's a good example. All the Rage, same thing. Amazing turnout in New York. We just really had incredible response. No one else would book it. No one, not one. So it was just that same frustration. But here I am, I'm fine. And I was able to, I was able to respond to that and just recognize, mm -hmm. you know, of course, because it's so difficult. And, you know, it's so difficult for people to buy. And just able to kind of like step back from it, not take it personally, it hasn't been easy. It's frustrating but I, I didn't end up on the floor. And this time it was even worse than any other. You know? mm -hmm. So that last time on the floor in the movie, I don't know how many years ago it was now. But Let's see, it would be 2011, so eight years ago. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, have you been on the floor like that since then? No, I haven't. But my so foot was still it. is a barometer. Like yeah. when I'm stressed and you know, um, it, it, will, it will bother me and that helps me be like, okay, it is time for me to go sit in the other room, meditate, and just be with this. Because, you know, some of these are learned behaviors, and some of them are literally learned muscle responses. And it's really, really hard to shift those. Um, but I do continue to do the work, uh, not as regularly as I might, and, and I'm, I'm constantly getting more and more capable. I, the one thing I would say is there's two books that help me immeasurably be beyond you know, Dr. Sarna's book and uh, Dr. David Clark's book, if you have get gut issues, that's in really important, called They Can't Find Anything Wrong. Dr. Mate's book, When the Body Says No. Um, Dr. Mate told me to read Eckhart Tolle's book, um, A New Earth. And I read that book on a flight with my daughter and my sister um, to go on a vacation. My mother is incredibly anxious. My daughter is kind of anxious. And the two of them get at each other. Uh, and it can be really quite difficult for me to deal with my mother's anxiety. So on that trip, I read about it. I read this thing, which was all about um, just deep, deep empathy. So if, if someone's driving you crazy, if you can put yourself in a place of, th instead of thinking, oh my God, they're driving me crazy, thinking, oh my God, it must be so hard to be them. Then you go to this place of empathy. And what happened on that trip, which was so powerful, and that goes back to the energy, rather than unconsciously react to the energy, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't respond like, going, mom, be quiet or anything. I'd be like, yes, it's okay. I'll handle it. It was really closed energy, just trying to protect myself. When I was just like completely empathetic and I said, and I so we were, there's something with the rental car. My mom was really freaking out. I was like, no, really, mom, don't worry about it. I got it. It's going to be fine. And when she felt heard rather than, you know, slightly resisted, she felt fully heard. She just went, Whew. and from the rest of the trip, everything was awesome. Because I was no longer resisting her, even in an um, unconscious way. I was, and it wasn't like I was kowtowing or, or uh, pandering to her. I was just listening to her. Because most of the time, she didn't even need me to do anything. She just felt so anxious she needed to be heard and supported. And I did that without overdoing it. And everything was fine. It was such an incredible, mind-bending experience to see that just that energy shift. Is, and it was not major. Because it wasn't like I was acting out at her. I just was closed off to protect myself. And so once I just allowed myself to just be like, oh, it's annoying. <sighs> yeah, mom, it's going to be all right. It was all all right. And ever since then, our relationship has started to heal in a profoundly different way. And that was six years, seven years ago or something, but it's been on a constant upswing. Um, then there's another book that a guy in the movie named Dr. John Sklar insisted that I read. And this student wasn't ready when he told me to the first time. I said, sure, I'll read it. It's too busy. But it's basically a 10-week um, meditation program called the presence process by an author named Michael Brown and the presence process each week you have a mantra and you have this 20 minute meditation in the morning and 20 minute in the evening um, but each week you're going a little bit deeper and in week three it's you are every time someone's uh, you feel mad at somebody you have to do what you can to check out of the situation and say I'll be right back and go figure out what that says about you because if you're mad at them, 
it's because you have an idea that what they're doing is not okay or what they're asking of you is not okay, but that's just a frame. And so if you respond with anger, then the thing escalates. But if you respond with knowledge and, and without anger and you realize it's not about you, then you don't respond with anger. And the whole thing dies down and it doesn't really matter. Like they may yell at you because you, did, you, know, you, you got in front of them in line and it's easy to get mad when somebody yells at you. Maybe their response was totally out of line. But that was about them. It wasn't about you. And so if you respond as if it's about you, then you're getting angry. But if you realize it's all about them, and once you're able to start doing that on a daily basis, you stop getting mad. You know? You're know, not protecting yourself. And when you stop getting mad, you're not wasting all that energy. And all that energy is just a distraction from shame. Because really, if someone's mad at you, you feel shamed. And so you're just trying to protect yourself from that shame. But it's really, that shame's about you. And so when you stop, it's just like everything just gets easier. And that's yeah. an incredibly healing thing as well. Yeah, such important deep <laughs> stuff. <laughs> this conversation is like all over the place, but in such a great way, you know. Because oh, I feel like that's way too all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, you know, all of what you're saying is just so relevant, so meaningful. And, um, you know, there are a couple things you mentioned. One earlier on talking about the barometer that your mm-hmm. foot is, it sounds like. And I think okay. that, you know, our bodies are barometers and our symptoms and what we feel, they're messages. And I think mm-hmm. that we are programmed or not, we're, we become programmed to, igno- yeah. to ignore this. We, we yeah. just like, we, we're like, oh, I just push through. It's just a little pain, just push through. I or should, you have a fear response and you go, oh, there's pain. And so you get distracted in that way. It's like, I got to go to the doctor about this because there might be something wrong physically. But yeah. it's almost, well, sometimes there is something wrong physically. And, and it's interesting. Again, you know, I knew my mother was under incredible stress and in through uh, like the fall. And, it, you know, part of it had to do with the fact she was turning 84 on December 12th. December 30th would have been his, her 60th anniversary. And today is the 13th anniversary of my father's death. So um, I just realized that as I said it, which is kind of mm-hmm. profound. But all of those things were really stressing her as well as some other stresses. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I was thinking, okay, she's really stressed and she was, her memory was really starting to go and she was having trouble breathing. Um, so there was a physical response that wasn't just pain. It was actually her immune system was compromised and she got sick. She got pneumonia and it was really bad. Uh, it was really bad. Um, I mean, like I was letting go for yeah. her. I told her, you know, you go if you want. And, um, interestingly enough, that whole process where I did, I slept five nights in the ICU with her and I just kept a hand on her, just literally kept a hand on her. And she got kind of delusional and she thought of, she kept confusing me with my father, which was her husband, which was a little weird and a little creepy, mm-hmm. but, and I resisted it, but finally I just went with it. And I think it finally allowed her. Uh, to process some of that loss of my father. And one of the things, you know, what I really recognized in that space was when he died, she had kind of a breakdown. It was like, nobody will ever love me again. Nobody will. And I'm like, I'm sitting here. You're you're saying that to me. It's not very comfortable. But she really did feel unlovable. And he had been the love of her life for 40 plus years. And I think she still never felt that way. And so by being able to be there and be consciously open and just present and loving, I think she did process it. And she's, she's been in the rehab. I'm going to go now and get her. After she got out of the ICU, she went to hospital for one day. They had thought she was going to be, have to be on high oxygen for like a week. She was out of the hospital like four days before they even considered she'd be in a hospital room, right? So then she went to the rehab. Her memory is still pretty compromised though. But she's supposed to get out and go to, back to her home today. So after we leave here, I might go home and pick her up, which is all a miraculous a situation but it just struck me how insane it is that it's on the anniversary of his death. Yeah, well, that maybe that will be the completion of that, that healing of being able to feel loved. You know, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> it's a, it's a, well, it's a good reminder. Yeah, yeah, it's a good reminder that there's just, uh, you know, I think we all have expectations of how healing should look and what the time frame of healing should be. Right. But, um, you know, you said something also earlier about just letting go and allowing for you know because when we expect and hope for things we get we clench and we get constricted and you know i remember someone telling me 
you know, you can't receive when you're holding on. If you imagine your hands like this holding on, you can't receive with right. open hands when you're grasping. So I think that that's another really important, subtle and profound message when it comes to letting healing happen. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and being, and you know, also, I mean, I'll just say it again, but like so many of us don't really feel like we're worthy of love. And so mm -hmm. that's why we're always trying to do for others because we don't feel all that lovable ourselves or that we deserve to be loved. We should be the ones loving other people And you know, all of this, every aspect of about it is just literally the whole movie is about balance. It's about finding that space where there is something physical going on, but it's equally emotional. And so the problem that we have is that because we have a culture that is entirely, you know, the physical ate the emotional, you know, and it hasn't passed through the other side yet to this, you know, we're in that kind of, you know, Hegelian dialectic where it's still, I mean, it's just, it's being crushed by that. Although the, the cool thing is that tale is starting to come out the other side. And I think more and more people recognize, um, recognize that. And, and I do think this shift is happening at ever increasing rapidity. So hopefully, you know, th there was an article in the times yesterday that someone shared with me and it was like, there's a study and it says, actually, if your doctor looks at you and talks to you, then the placebo effect is much stronger. <laughs> like how anyone would have to study that or understand it or like that it would be a surprise is surreal like yeah. yes of course you're gonna feel more loved and you're gonna heal better if somebody yeah. gives you love and presence like, like surprise surprise yeah yeah but it's a you know big front page story of yeah. the health section <laughs> yeah when it came to dr sarno's work i mean i know he was obviously specializing in back pain but how much um you know at his presentations and lectures and stuff how much did he talk about you know more of what we're talking about here and now? I think entirely. I don't. I don't yeah. like. So this is an inter interesting thing about um, Dr. Sardos. He was 94 when he passed away, and he actually passed away the day before the movie opened in New York. And we found oh, out. Oh, I didn't that realize that. Opened. Yeah, and that would have been his 94th birthday. Wow. So he died. You know, the last Auspicious. day of his 93rd year. The the day before the film opened. You know, it's, yeah. okay, I, I'm letting this go now. But um, that was crazy. And, and, you know, just even in terms of the resistance, there probably would not have even been a Times op-ed if the movie wasn't opening. I mean, uh, obituary, because he had never been written about in the Times. And that's how they, uh, I mean, it's just, and, and even still, like, mm -hmm. you would think that the movie did really well, and he died the opening weekend. We still have not had anyone write about the movie in a, in a real way. There's not one article about the film. One like there's one yeah. slightly dismissive article on Vox.com, um, but that only happened because the, the writer wrote an article about back pain and, and didn't write anything about Dr. Sarno. She actually wrote a, about this book called Crooked and the Back Pain Industry by Catherine Raman, who Catherine Raman has chapter six is all about Sarno. But this author chose not to um, the uh, author of the article, the journalist chose not to actually mention Sarno. So I wrote her a note, as did like four thousand other people. So she finally agreed to do, she thought it was all woo and nonsense and so wouldn't do it. So she wrote another article and the headline was, this doctor believes your pain is all in your head and thousands of people agree. And so I, I begged her, could you please change that headline? Because that's not true. He never it's said a little, it. It's a head. little clickbait. It's a little clickbaity. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, but it's also completely factually incorrect. Yeah. He never said it's all in your head. In fact, that's the misnomer that allows people to reject him. And language is important. She said, we stand by the, the title. So, but that's, that's been our experience. I'm just saying there's just so much resistance from those in power to even just discuss this idea. Well, so, so it's not all in your head. So could you rectify, yes. clarify? Well, that's what I was just saying. It's, it's a head. balance. What's in the head? All right, so if you have a computer, right? Uh, the computer has hardware and software, right? So if we look at our bodies, our body is the hardware, right? That's the physical. Our brain is the software, right? It's the operating system that runs the body. Now, a computer without the software is a brick. It doesn't, it, it doesn't act as a computer, right? It needs that language to work. Our bodies are the same way. So whatever software we put in, and what they tell you about writing software is garbage in, garbage out, right? <laughs> so if you're writing code that is terrible, then you're gonna have terrible results for your body. But if you write clean, 
balanced code for your brain about being present, non-reactive, um, then the whole system will work better. So he was never saying it's all in your head, but he was saying that it can start in your head. It, like, you do not have pain without awareness of pain. Pain, by definition, is a physical and emotional response to um, tissue damage or fear or like uh, or um, suspicion of tissue damage. Threatened, threatened yeah. damage, yeah. Thre yeah. Or, the, or the threat of tissue damage, yeah. right? So even there, the threat of tissue damage causes pain. So pain is a message, right? And if we listen to the message, then we can avoid that thing. But if we listen to what's causing the pain, which usually is not something that's physical, like a torn, like herniated discs, like that whole thing, it's so insane. Like no, everyone's like, no, the scientists all go, oh, well, I see it here, so that's it. That's not true. It, if you actually do a study with 300 people and you put them in an MRI machine, you give those MRIs to a radiologist and say, tell me who has pain, they can't tell you. Because people who look like, their backs look like Hiroshima after the blast, have no pain, and people who have perfect looking, no herniations, no nothing, can be in terrible pain. So what we know from science is that that is not a causal correlation. So what you see on the, I mean, now the, what is true about science is if you do an x-ray of people with a broken arm and you see a break in a bone, all of those people will be in pain unless they have that disease that doesn't allow you to feel pain. Mm -hmm. We know that, but that's not true with soft tissue issues, right? So now what science tells us is Actually, seeing something and having 100% correlation means there's correlation. Seeing something and having it have actually no real correlation to what we're talking about, that's not science if you, if you don't believe that. So Gina Collada has written a series of articles since 2004 talking about these different – she writes science stuff for the Times. There was a big study in 2004 that first found this. She wrote about another one in 2006. In 2016, she wrote like the fifth article that says – how has practice not changed? Rather than stopping doing steroid shots, rather than stopping doing these laminectomies and all these other things, like steroid shots have gone up 600% since I first started writing about this and their cost has gone up 3,000%. You know, it's like nonsense, right? It's not working. And so this is the problem. So if you're actually talking about it from a science perspective and you're not in your willful blindness stage and all of the evidence tells us that we're doing it wrong, right? But what, that doesn't mean that there isn't something physically hurting. Right. And sometimes, you know, you will like someone, there's a point in the movie where someone has a, a Achilles tendon tear. Six months later, she still has pain. So she says, so that might be TMS, right? He says, absolutely. Your body will heal in like three to four months. If you still have pain after that, that's actually a residual belief that there's something wrong when there's not. Yeah. 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 It's the distinction between acute pain and chronic pain. Okay. And cro chronic pain is when are, we are perceiving pain, although we're not in any immediate threat or danger. We get in this truth, cycle. It can also be true of acute pain as well. There's a good story about a guy who, like, yeah. he's yeah. wearing you know boots and he steps on a nail and the board sticks in his foot. He's like screaming in pain, and so they they put him in an ambulance and they take him to the hospital. They they cut off the sides because they're worried it, it was a really big bolt or something. And um, they get in the hospital. They take off his boot, and it hasn't gone through the, the sole. <laughs> you know, so he's got this incredible pain and actually I th I'm tr I, it, it was just be, fear it was Pure just fear. fear and i think it's lorma mosley even who's a really important pain scientist just a ted talk about this he has a story about himself even that he went when he was young he got bitten by a, a very poisonous snake and the pain was searing and when he was an adult he was walking somewhere and he um brushed it some brush hit his leg and it felt it triggered that memory of the snake bite and he felt it ground in terrible pain but quickly realized that it was just a, a weed but it triggered that thing and I, I can't number if it's him who tells it but there was a guy who kept having um these terrible bouts of um of leg pain where he had been hit by shrapnel in vietnam when and his wife was with him and he would like fall to the ground in incredible pain which has come out of nowhere and his wife like the 15th time it happened she said you know, I just recognized that the last two times this happened, there was a helicopter going by. And the shrapnel was during Vietnam when he was running for a helicopter. Like he got hit by the shrapnel and he got pulled onto the helicopter. So every time he would hear a helicopter, it would trigger that pain that he had felt at that time. And once he knew that, it stopped. It's these things that are unconscious that are the deepest. And Dr. Um, Clark has this incredible story about a woman with terrible pain, um, gut pain that he was seeing. And he went in to talk to her and 
He said, so where's the pain? Because no one could help her. She'd been in the hospital for weeks with this just, it's like incredible pain, all these opioids, just trying to help her find some relief and like she couldn't. He walked in and said, so where's the pain? And she pointed to it. And I don't know if this will be video, but she made like a, a, her hand in the, in the shape of a gun and she pointed towards basically her appendix area. But it was on the other side. So it wasn't her appendix. Um, and, um, you know, so the lower gut area. And so he immediately recognized there's something there because he, he had learned to pull out people's stories. He said, have you ever had anything traumatic happen? And she said, well, you know, I've had some traumas in my life, but I, probably the worst is, yeah, I saw my brother get shot in a bar and killed. And that was 10 years ago. And I had a lot of therapy and I dealt with it and it's been fine. So I don't think that's it. He said, well, anything else? She said, well, you know, a couple weeks ago, I went home and I visited my dad and I, di I saw the guy in a, in a quickie mart who had killed my brother. I just saw him. I didn't, no one had told me she was out of jail. And it was a, so that was a real shock, you know? And he goes, okay, so where did your brother get shot? And as soon as he said it, she knew, because that's where the pain was. And wow. she just turned white as a sheet and she left an hour later. Wow. So yeah. these things that are unconscious, the deep, most deeply unconscious things are the ones that, you know, we can, if we try and think what, how does this connect to our story, you can often figure it out. Yeah. And then on the other side of thing, uh, other side of the story, there's people who, you know, walk across hot coals and don't feel pain on their feet. And, you know, so yeah. pain is definitely a weird, weird thing, you know, well, and we get anesthesia and then we get cut open and we don't feel anything. <laughs> Isn't that kind of crazy? You know, it is we, interesting. But you know, what's interesting just, to me, though, they, you know what they give you when they give you anesthesia? And I learned this because I had no surgery when I was a kid. And that was, that was the most pain I've ever been in. Or when I was like, they mess with your, they also give you the amnesic to mess exactly. with your Exactly. And I said, yeah. no, I don't want that because they explained it before. And I said, I don't want that. I like, I don't want, I mean, I even then I was conscious of this idea that if bad things happen to you and you're not conscious of it, but you're they're still in your unconscious, it'll fuck you up. So I said, no, I don't want this. I said, Trust me, you want yeah, it. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, it, but that does tell you that even with anesthesia, they also have to cut off your consciousness. Because oftentimes we are feeling that pain, even in surgery. It's just that we don't remember it afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point too. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating stuff. So um, in, your, in your world now, these days, uh, what, el what other cool documentaries, what films, what are you working on? Well, we're working on one that's, uh, that's kind of connected, but not actually right after we finished All the Rage, we made a film called Working in Protest, which was 30 years of our protest work. And in the last um, year and a half, we've been making a film called The Commons, which is about protest against the Silent Sam Confederate statue on the University of North Carolina campus. And it's completely observational. We're just, it's called The Commons because we just film in that space uh, and we don't have any characters it's partly a reaction to, I'd say, I don't like systems. Like there's something that happened with documentary is that it all became very much social issue oriented, um, which also meant it became very colonialist because it was kind of about making something about the other and saying, oh, isn't this terrible? We need to fix this problem. But if you're making a social issue documentary with the goal of changing something, then really what you're doing is you're making propaganda. And so, you know, even as we made all the rage, we had to resist that. Like the people who love Dr. Sarno wanted the film to be propaganda. And they were kind of frustrated at first that it wasn't more, you know, pushing the agenda. But it's like, yeah. if it did that, it wouldn't work. It, it would work yeah. for a very small audience and it would be, they, that would really fire them up just like in this way that would only create more resistance. So it might have, it might have had more success to start with, but I think over time it's going to be much more useful. Um, but that also, part of the other thing about documentaries also became character driven, right? So you have to find your character. But then when you, when you get a character, you, there's this otherizing colonialist process that you know you're making about somebody else that's not you, and so you can be you're judging in some way, even as you're trying not. So the whole reaction to that was like, okay, we're not going to make any characters. This is going to be completely observation. We're going to force the audience to be in this space and make their own judgments. It's really uncomfortable because mm -hmm. even the people that we are the protesting that we are largely we believe in what they're doing, they don't always look so good, and so then people are like, oh, they're they really reject it, but it's like, well. This is what's going on in that space. And the only way to really document it is to just be as real as possible, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, so that, so in other words, the process of making All the Rage really informed the process of making this movie. But what's interesting is, I just realized the other day, 
talking about how all these different things connect over time. The day after I graduated high school, the Klan marched in my hometown of Chapel Hill, where I now live again. Um, and I took pictures and I found those pictures and then we made a short film that actually sparked that movie working in protest. But um, where the Klan marches, they're marching right towards that statue at the beginning of that thing. So the very first shoot I ever did is connected to the most recent project in this really mm. deep longitudinal way that's surreal. So anyway, yeah, I just think about all these things. Like when you start to look at these things in these complex ways, there's all kinds of wild connectivity that we oftentimes want to not recognize because then it makes our world so complex and we just want things to be simpler so we can understand them. <laughs> but when we do that, we actually are just like putting up, building little walls around ourselves so that we can have a simpler life, but it's a much less full life. Yeah, I can really appreciate that. <laughs> I, can, I, can feel, I can feel your artisticness coming through. <laughs> It's very refreshing to me because I am I don't embody my my inner artist, but uh, well, you, you I, clearly I, do in the way that you do healing, right? Like so, yeah. you're you're you know you could say you're a naturopathic doctor, but really what you are is you're a healing artist, right? So mm -hmm. you're working with the material that you have, which is the patient, and helping turn that into something that is more beautiful and whole, right? That's you're like a potter. All right, yeah, I'm potting people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're, you're molding, the, helping them mold their clay, so it will work. Yeah, better. yeah, love it. Well, it's been a really great conversation. Really, have, have appreciated it. Thanks for yeah. making the time and enlightening us with uh, more about Dr. Sarno, more about healing pain, all sorts of pain, not just back pain. But um, yeah. it's been great. And, and all, all illness, really, all autoimmune disease. You know what really? connects yeah. all the autoimmune diseases? What do this. they all have in common? Yeah. Well, this. They all have no known etiology. Well, we don't know what causes lupus. We don't know what causes rheumatoid arthritis. We don't know what causes MS. We don't know what causes fibromyalgia. Yep. And, and the kind of flow through between all of them is they're literally constellations of symptoms, right? right. And, and many of them, you, like I'm going to tell you one last story, which is really wild. But a friend of mine um, runs a print shop and he was getting photographed for AARP magazine, not because he's that age mm -hmm. yet, but because it was about entrepreneurs. And he was actually in the very first movie we made, so which is how we're friends. We were in bands together. And um, the photographer's assistant, he, he was like, he, it was taking up his whole day, so he's getting a little frustrated because he thought it was going to be an hour, but they were setting up for hours and he couldn't do his work or whatever. But the um, photographer's assistant who was setting up the lights and moving was complaining about kidney stone pain. He was just saying, man, he passed a kidney stone. It was the most pain he's ever had in his life, blah, blah, blah. And the photographer said, you know, last year I had Crohn's disease for six months. Well, at least I went to the doctor. They said it was Crohn's and someone said it was this bacterial thing. And then I went back to somebody else who said it was Crohn's. And then I went to this doctor who prescribed this movie called All the Rage. And I watched it that night. And the next day, the Crohn's was gone and has not come back. Not knowing that this guy knew me. Just it came out randomly, which was. So, so the point is, is that disease he was told he had was just a constellation of symptoms. And finally, when someone was able to tell him, I think that it's actually stress, and I think this movie will help you figure that out, it works. And I'm just going to go back to this last point, which is earlier we talked about, you know, uh, that I'd want to say then, but it's something about this idea that, like, it's not about convincing anybody. It's like literally getting the shift of perspective just slightly. So when Dr. Sarno would say, are you open to this idea? They were open to the idea, but they didn't even know it right? So if you shift them to that perspective, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, if you're a photographer, you, uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm trying to get the sun right behind something. So it backlights people, but this is very narrow window that you can get that in. Like if you're trying to get this really perfect lighting, they get a little halo effect or a plant or something. So you move just a little bit and it pops into place and everything's clear. I just And it's the same, just this little move. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I was kind of aware that that sun was there. And if I moved a little bit, I would do that but I never tried it. And now that you've said that, that it's related to what's going on in my life, you know, I did just lose my job and uh, I'm having some trouble with my husband. So that makes a ton of sense. I'm sure that's what it is. I'm going to go deal with that. You're done. That's it. Yeah. Just awareness. Yeah. And, you know, and I'll just add, there's that, there's the physical or the, there's the metaphysical rather mm -hmm. there's the emotional and there's often, you know, environmental physical things that we can do to amplify the healing as well. So just as Dr. Sarno would say, it's, it starts in the mind, but it manifests in the body. We can, we can still work with the body. We can still, you know, Absolutely. maybe not touch as much. Is incredible. You yeah, know, like touch just, has, that's the thing. When I kept a hand on my mom, that 
like and one night I did step almost the whole night because she was really in distress. And she was actually, it was when she was getting better. But when she was getting better, more stuff was coming up. And I just had to keep a hand on her to keep her asleep. Otherwise, she would keep waking up and going, oh, you know, just keeping mm-hmm. her asleep allowed her to heal. And just feeling, I, I actually, I realized that I needed to be like a weighted blanket. I literally had to kind of push down, not just touch, I had to kind of be heavy to make her feel like she wasn't floating away. And that was that. It's really wild yeah. when you start to pay attention. Yeah. They've got those weighted blankets now for the help anxiety. anxiety. Exactly. Because yeah. you feel like you need someone to hold you. Yeah, yeah. you need that yeah. physical. So anyway, we could yeah. go on and on and on. <laughs> it's it's, it's been a lot on. of fun. <laughs> been a lot of fun. Thanks again, Michael. Um, where where can people find more about your work? Well, so we have our website is rumor.com, R-U-M-U-R. It's a palindrome. The R faces the U's and comes up into the M. Um, but also all the rage doc as in documentary. So all the rage doc.com uh, to get the movie. And it's on, it's available on demand on Vimeo on demand, but like within weeks, it'll be on Amazon and iTunes. So oh, probably great. by the time you edit this down to the 12 minutes cool. it needs to be. <laughs> oh, no, we're, this is a full feature. <laughs> we're not editing this much. This is a full oh, feature. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're the editor. I'm not the editor. <laughs> no, my wife is the editor. And you know, I can't, you know, like you, I was gonna say earlier, like Suki, make sense of all this the complexity she's the, she's the good judgmental person who helps make sense of it oh cool well yeah. good that you have that one good on judgment. hand <laughs> all right well uh peace love yeah Until next i'll talk time. to you soon yeah we'll we'll, right. we'll pick this up again in a couple months all right.